Greeting, tonight I bring you three true scary stories to darken your evening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. Prepare yourself as we dive into the depths of true horror. Story 1. I work at Goth Hooters, we have some strange rules for interacting with customers. Ophelias have been popping up everywhere lately, haven't they? I mean, just a few years ago, I don't recall them even existing. But now, there are at least 50 of them scattered across North America. If you've never heard of them, let me fill you in. Ophelia's is a restaurant chain. They primarily serve pub food and cocktails, although credit where it's due, it's top-notch pub food and cocktails. This is probably the main reason they've grown so rapidly. Some people dub it Goth Hooters, but that's not quite the right comparison. Sure, they have attractive wait staff, but they're nothing like Hooters girls. Their outfits are less revealing, usually consisting of a loose band tee paired with either black shorts and stockings or black pants. Flirting with customers is highly discouraged, and they're not even allowed to make direct eye contact with patrons, as we'll get to in a moment. In my opinion, a better comparison for Ophelia's would be the Hard Rock Cafe. They share a similar vibe, but Ophelia's leans more towards an 80s goth slash punk theme. The furniture is all black, while the walls are stark white, creating a monochrome color palette. Band memorabilia and posters of iconic groups like The Cure or Bauhaus decorate the walls, along with black and white movie posters or stills, Think Miss Feratu and the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Walking into an Ophelia's might feel a bit odd, but it works. Some locations even feature live music, and as I mentioned earlier, the food is exceptional. So, when the new Ophelia's opened up in town and advertised a bartending position, I decided to apply. I had the experience of student loans to pay off, and an appetite for a paycheck to cover those loans, maybe even some groceries as a treat. Working at Ophelia's wasn't bad at all. Behind the quirky exterior, it was pretty much like any other restaurant I'd worked in. They compensated us well, and the staff were treated with respect. If it weren't for the VIP bar and its peculiar set of rules, I'd say there was nothing remotely special about Ophelia's. But there's the catch, the VIP bar and its rules. On my first day, the owner, whose name I won't disclose for privacy, sat me down to go over those rules, emphasizing their importance. These rules serve as guidance and a precaution, he explained. Corporate insists on their strict enforcement. So, keep them in mind during your shifts. Some may seem odd, but they're there for a reason. I assured him of my understanding and commitment to following these rules, though I couldn't help but wonder why they existed in the first place. So, what were these rules for working at Ophelia's? Allow me to elaborate. I've reviewed them so many times that I've memorized them by heart, and they were displayed prominently throughout the restaurant, in the kitchen, behind the bar, and by the employee lockers. 1. If a guest presents a black card, take it to the bar and scan it. If it's approved by our system, escort them to the VIP bar, accessible through an unmarked door in the rear of the restaurant. 2. If the card is not approved, immediately notify management. Do not inform the guest or engage in conversation with them. No new guests may be seated until the unapproved guest is handled. Refer to lockdown and evacuation procedures for escalation instructions. 3. Regularly review and be familiar with lockdown and evacuation procedures. The safety of our staff and guests is paramount. Know the emergency exits and safe zones within the restaurant. 4. Only employees with a violet lanyard may access the VIP bar. Under no circumstances are you to discuss the VIP bar with employees wearing a violet lanyard. 5. Wait staff must not follow guests into the VIP bar, even if invited. If a guest invites a staff member into the VIP bar, they must decline and report the incident to management. 
6. Do not discuss the VIP bar or its policies with outsiders. Violating this rule will result in termination. 7. While on shift, you will be assigned a name to use with customers. You must use that name at all times while inside the restaurant. Never disclose your real name under any circumstances. 8. For your safety, avoid making direct eye contact with any guests, especially if they present a black card. 9. If a guest requests to meet up with you outside of work or asks for your real name, politely decline. If the guest persists, contact management. 10. If you suspect a guest has followed you outside of work, promptly inform management. They will determine whether to involve the police or handle the situation differently. Do not contact the police independently. I must admit, the rules seem strange. No eye contact, the use of fake names, a strong emphasis on reporting issues to management rather than contacting the police, it all raised suspicions. Then there was the intricate set of rules surrounding the VIP bar, and it was clear they took them extremely seriously. I witnessed the head waitress, Persephone, reprimand some employees for flirting with customers or revealing their real names, even terminating a few on the spot. One employee lost their job for posting the rules online, and another bartender, who started around the same time I did, was dismissed for attempting to sneak into the VIP bar. Persephone wasn't typically strict, quite the opposite, she was rather easygoing most of the time. However, when it came to enforcing the rules, she left no room for debate, and the same applied to the management. Speaking of the VIP bar, its nature remained a mystery to most employees, including myself. We had our speculations, but the prevailing theory was that it housed illegal activities, ranging from a Breaking Bad-style drug lab to human trafficking. More moderate theories suggested it was merely a meeting place for dubious characters or an exclusive speakeasy. Nevertheless, most of us never truly knew what transpired down there, and those who did remain tight-lipped. Despite the secrecy, I personally believed whatever occurred in the VIP bar was likely not illegal. Every Ophelia's I'd visited had one, and they couldn't all be drug dens. Furthermore, most of the handful of staff members with access were bartenders, implying a legitimate bar existed down there. I didn't dwell on it too much. The regular bartending job paid well, and the absence of any police investigations suggested that whatever happened in the VIP bar was legitimate. My curiosity about the VIP bar remained, but it rarely impacted my day-to-day -day work. Occasionally, a customer would present a black card, I'd scan it, and if it was approved, which it always was, I'd escort them to the VIP bar. They'd return upstairs in an hour or so, except if they were too inebriated or disruptive, in which case the downstairs bouncer would turn them away. I'd never laid eyes on the downstairs bouncer, but I'd heard of their existence. The black card holders never stood out to me in any significant way. They seemed like ordinary individuals going about their business. Some came alone, some in groups, some dined before descending, and some after. A few became regulars and greeted me with a nod or brief wave as I led them downstairs. Otherwise, they kept to themselves. As for the lack of eye contact, it rarely affected me since most customers abided by it naturally. Some would glance up while ordering, but they'd look at my forehead or my chin rather than meeting my gaze directly. It was odd but easily tolerated. Plus, it wasn't like I needed to look into their eyes to serve them drinks. Months passed, and I settled into a comfortable routine at Ophelia's. I'd even formed a few friendships with co-workers outside of work, though I still referred to them by their Ophelia's aliases. And despite my initial reservations about the rules, I'd come to accept them as part of the job. That is until the night I encountered the man with the hollow eyes. It was a typical evening shift. I was stationed behind the bar, serving drinks, and chatting with a few regulars. As I wiped down a glass with a rag, I glanced up to see a man standing at the bar, his face obscured by shadows. 
My first instinct was to greet him and ask what he'd like to order, but then I noticed his eyes, or rather, the absence of them. Hollow sockets stared back at me, like two endless voids. I froze, my mouth agape for a moment before I remembered the rules. I quickly looked down and away, maintaining my composure as best I could. I didn't want to alarm the other customers. Can I help you with something? I asked, my voice steady but my heart racing. The man didn't respond immediately. I could feel his presence, his eyes, or lack thereof, fixed on me. Finally, he spoke, his voice dry and raspy. A black card, he said, extending a pale hand toward me, a black card clutched between bony fingers. I took the card from him, my hand trembling ever so slightly. I scanned it quickly, and as expected, it was approved. I couldn't bear to look at him, but I couldn't ignore the rules either. Follow me, I said, leading him toward the unmarked door at the back of the restaurant, my heart pounding in my chest. As we descended the staircase, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. The rules, the secrecy, and now this man with the hollow eyes had all combined to create a heavy atmosphere that sent shivers down my spine. My footsteps echoed in the dimly lit stairwell, and I couldn't see the man's face, but I knew his gaze was fixed on me. We reached the bottom of the stairs, and the heavy, unmarked door loomed in front of us. I glanced at the card reader next to it, which was adorned with a small black Ophelia's logo. I swiped the black card, and the door clicked open. As it swung open, a waft of cold, damp air greeted us. Inside, the VIP bar was unlike anything I could have imagined. It was more than just a basement lounge, it was like stepping into an entirely different world. The walls were lined with dark, ornate wood paneling, and crimson velvet curtains draped from the ceiling, casting the room in a dim, eerie light. Black candles and wrought iron holders flickered on every available surface, and the bar itself was a gleaming black marble. The patrons in the VIP bar were equally unusual. Some sat alone, staring into their drinks with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. Others huddled in small groups, speaking in hushed tones. Everyone was impeccably dressed in dark attire, and a sense of unease hung in the air. I led the man with the hollow eyes to an empty seat at the bar, and he perched on the stool, his gaze still locked on me. I couldn't see his face, but I could feel his presence like a weight on my shoulders. He placed his black card on the bar, and I prepared to take his order. What would you like to drink? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Something strong, he replied, his voice sending a shiver down my spine. I quickly mixed a drink for him my hands trembling as I did. I slid it across the bar to him without making eye contact and placed a black napkin in front of him. He took the glass, and I noticed that his fingers were unnaturally long and bony. As he sipped his drink, I glanced around the room, taking in the peculiar patrons and the eerie atmosphere. It was then that I noticed a small stage at one end of the bar. A red velvet curtain was drawn closed, hiding whatever lay behind it. The man with the hollow eyes followed my gaze and seemed to nod ever so slightly. You'll want to stay away from that, he said, his voice low and ominous. I nodded, not wanting to provoke him further. I continued to serve drinks to the other patrons, my anxiety growing with each interaction. The rules had always seemed strange, but now they felt suffocating, as if they were meant to protect us from something lurking in the shadows. As the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, not just by the patrons but by something unseen. I longed for the safety of the well-lit main floor of the restaurant, away from this bizarre underworld. Finally, the man with the hollow eyes signaled for his tab. I printed it out and handed it to him without a word. He placed a wad of cash on the bar, and I quickly made a change, not wanting to prolong our interaction any further. As he rose from his stool and turned to leave, he leaned in close, his breath cold against my ear. Remember, he whispered, what happens here stays here. Discretion is your only protection. 
With that ominous warning, he exited the VIP bar, leaving me with a sense of relief and dread in equal measure. I returned to the main floor of the restaurant, my heart still racing. I couldn't wait to finish my shift and put this bizarre experience behind me. But as I continued to serve drinks and interact with customers, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets lay hidden beneath Ophelia's, and what kind of world I had unwittingly become a part of. The man with the hollow eyes had left an indelible mark on me, a reminder that some mysteries were better left unsolved. And as I continued to work at Ophelia's, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had only scratched the surface of the enigmatic world that existed beneath the restaurant's monochrome exterior. To this day, I can't help but wonder what truly goes on in the VIP bar and what lies behind that red velvet curtain on the small stage. But one thing is for certain, I'll never look at Ophelia's, or its rules, the same way again. Story 2 my son's reflection is wrong. I have always been afraid of mirrors, ever since I was a young child. I knew it was irrational, of course. I never felt fear when I saw my reflection in a puddle or on the darkened window of a shop as I walked down the street. It was specifically mirrors that made me uncomfortable. I always feared that I would see something other than myself looking back at me. This explains why I was less than thrilled to find the large, antique silver mirror in the bedroom of the house I was renting. Had it been my own place, I would have thrown it out then and there, leaving it on the curb and relying solely on the mirror in the modern and well-kept bathroom for all necessary reflective purposes. Alas, I didn't think my landlord would think too highly of his tenant tossing out expensive antique furniture, so I contented myself with simply moving it into a spare room. I had moved to the house for the simple reason that it was fairly cheap, and I didn't have much choice. My husband had passed away earlier that year due to a heart condition, leaving me simultaneously a widow and solely responsible for the care of my son, Chester. Fortunately, my husband's life insurance policy turned out to be reasonably generous, but I still needed to downgrade our living situation if I was to take care of Chester without another source of income. Beyond the obvious fact that I have now been left to raise a child without the assistance of a spouse, there is another reason why I cannot supplement my funds by taking on a job, Chester is autistic. I want to make it very clear, I'm not an autism mom. I loathe the self-absorbed whiners who spend every spare second complaining about the immense burden of raising an autistic child, who bellyache endlessly about how difficult their lives are. I hate all the videos of exasperated parents recording their child's meltdown on camera, to show to all the world how difficult it is for them. I am disgusted whenever I see some selfish morons recommend ABA therapy to keep unruly autistic children's more unconventional behaviors in check. My son is not a cross to bear, not a weight on my shoulders. He is my child, and I love him. I won't deny it can be difficult sometimes, but I can only imagine how hard it is for him. I find the terms, high-functioning, and, low-functioning, are relatively useless descriptors. Like most things in life, it is a tad more complicated than that. Chester is, generally speaking, non-verbal, and I've never known him to say more than 20 words in a single day. In addition, he tends to get overstimulated quite quickly from loud noises and often flaps his hands as a form of stimming, especially when he is having some difficulty expressing what he wants. The only behavior of his that ever actually frustrates me is his elopement, which in the context of autism means that he has a tendency to wander off or run away whenever he feels stressed. We work around these traits, and I think, generally, I've been able to make life quite comfortable for him. Chester has always shown quite an aptitude for reading and writing, despite his relatively young age of only nine years old at the time we moved. When he needed something that could not be articulated through gestures or single words, he would write it down on a whiteboard I've given him for this purpose. To help with his sensory issues regarding loud noises, I purchased a set of earplugs for him, the same sort that one would wear at a gun range to prevent hearing loss. 
These generally aren't necessary within the confines of the house, but on those occasions when we do go out in public, I genuinely think they help him quite a bit. Given his condition, combined with the relative isolation of our new rural home, it was necessary to homeschool Chester, though that wasn't really been any sort of a problem. Before I got married, I spent a few years teaching elementary school, so I already have the required skills. I've always believed in a somewhat more active approach to learning than some of my peers, and since our new home is located directly next to a forest, this was fairly easy to accomplish. The house itself was rather old, built in the 1920s, if my landlord was to be believed. While recently renovated to a more modern standard at some point in the preceding decades, it still has an air of oldness to it, something in the angles and general structure of the place. The main feature that seemed significantly out of place was the wrought iron fence that surrounded the house, a far cry from the traditional wooden fence I was used to from a life in the suburbs. There was no formal gate that led out to the forest behind the house, just a gap in the fencing with a small pile of rusting iron posts nearby. I never asked the landlord about it but judging by a stump outside the boundaries of the backyard, I assumed a tree must have fallen down and damaged it. Children don't want to sit still and be lectured, they want to be outside, to run around and be active. I'd always try to teach Chester his lessons in a way that connected to the forest. I'd lift up logs and show him all the squirming creatures underneath so I could teach him all the differences between them. I'd have him count the rings of a fallen tree and teach him about the things that happened in the tree's long and storied life. I know that sometimes he would get bored. While I do believe kids love learning, I'm not an idiot. I know that sometimes children just want to run and play, but I genuinely do believe he got more out of our lessons in the woods than he would have gotten from a traditional school environment. Even outside of the context of Chester's lessons, we spent a lot of time in those woods, slipping out through the gap in the fence into the forest beyond. There was something so peaceful about that place, it felt remarkably untouched by the civilization that bordered it. I'm not sure exactly how far the forest extended, but it always seemed to go on forever, like if you just kept walking you could go the whole rest of your life surrounded by trees. I always kept a fairly close eye on Chester when we were out there. As much as I loved the place, I did often worry that he would simply run off, but there was never anything stressful enough in the woods to make him do so. The only real concern was to make sure he took off his shoes once he got back to the house, as otherwise, he would track dirt inside, making quite a mess. Things went on the way I described them for about a year after my husband's passing. In between my caring for Chester and all the mundane errands of modern life, I attended therapy and worked to move on from the loss. I began to make peace with the fact that he was gone. Chester and I celebrated his 10th birthday out in the woods, moving to the backyard once night fell so we could finish off the evening roasting hot dogs over the fire pit while I read him some relatively tame ghost stories. Chester didn't like scary movies or violent video games, but gently spooky stories, the sort that send a pleasant chill down your spine, made him quite happy. I believe I was reading out the mezzotint to him, when we heard the music. It was a soft, strange sound, a faint piping emanating from the forest beyond, gentle yet eerie somehow. The faint notes reminded me of the sound of panpipes, but not quite. If I listened very closely, I could almost discern a faint drumming as well. Chester looked out into the darkness beyond the fire, flapping his hands gently. He didn't seem upset or scared, just faintly awestruck. Fairies. I heard him whisper. I felt somewhat uncomfortable as we both looked out into the blackness of the forest. The sound of crickets had died utterly as soon as the piping began, and we sat in silence, listening to that peculiar and otherworldly performance. It felt like something out of a dream, and I don't think it would be possible for me to recall the melody in any real detail. It was ephemeral somehow, slipping through the cracks of my memory like water through a sieve even as I listened. At some point, the music ceased, and the crickets returned to their chirping. 
I led Chester back inside and tucked him gently into bed. I've never been especially afraid of intruders, given how far away we were from any major population center, but that night I double-checked that all the doors and windows in the house were firmly locked. I didn't sleep well that night. I'll admit I'd still not gotten used to sleeping alone, and often had difficulty falling asleep, but this felt different somehow. It seemed that whenever I was close to finally falling unconscious, I'd see a shadow pass across the wall or hear something just on the very edge of my perception, something that reminded me faintly of music. Whenever I'd jolt up in bed, looking or listening for what I thought had disturbed me, there was nothing there. At some point, I must have finally fallen asleep because I found myself blinking out the daylight from my uncovered window, groggy and irritable. My skull throbbed with a terrible headache. My alarm clock hadn't gone off, it seemed to have become unplugged in the night. Possibly in my tossing and turning, the cord had somehow come out of the socket. It was late morning, far later than I usually woke up, and Chester was frustrated because he hadn't had breakfast yet. He didn't say anything, but he seemed glum and looked at me with justifiable annoyance and hunger. I did my best to prepare him some scrambled eggs and bacon, but in my pain and fatigue, I managed to burn the bacon and cook the eggs to an unpleasant, rubbery consistency. I deeply regret what happened next. I swore about the bacon, the eggs, the pan, the stove, the landlord, my dead husband, anyone, and anything that could conceivably be even somewhat to blame for the ruined breakfast. I know it was wrong to react like that in front of my son, I know it was immature, but I was tired, in pain, and just wished desperately I could go back to bed. When I'd finished with my profanity-laced rant, I heard the back door closing and looked out the window to see Chester fleeing out into the forest, visibly distressed. I muttered to myself, and ran out the door after him, calling for him to come back. I tripped on one of the fallen iron fence posts and fell to the ground, knocking the air from my lungs. When I recovered enough to stand up, Chester was long gone, vanished among the trees. I looked through those woods for hours. As I've described earlier, I don't know how large the forest behind my house is, but it still feels odd that in all that time I never saw him. Chester's only ten years old, he isn't some sort of Olympic sprinter, and the foliage isn't so thick that I could have lost him that easily. I kept wandering among the trees, shouting out Chester's name with increasing panic. Sometimes I thought I'd hear a branch snapping or a child's giggle, and I would turn about, desperately trying to catch a glimpse of the sound source, but there would be nothing there. It was fairly far along in the afternoon when I finally decided to head back and call the police. Despite how long I'd spent in the forest, it was a remarkably quick walk back to the house. It felt almost as if the walk into the woods was somehow further than the walk out. I opened the door and started moving to the bedroom to get my phone, when I suddenly saw Chester sitting on the couch, reading a book. I nearly wept with relief and rushed to hug him, apologizing over and over for scaring him and asking if he was okay. I was so happy to see my son again I wasn't even angry with him for running off. I'm alright, mom. I'm really sorry for running off, I was just scared. I won't do that again, please don't be angry, said Chester, tears welling up in his eyes. I froze. Chester rarely spoke more than a single word at a time. His longest sentences I could remember before this were maybe three or four words long at most. This was utterly unprecedented, and I had no idea how to react whatsoever. Mom. Are you okay? He asked, looking at me with a confused look on his face. The next week went by very strangely. To be very clear, autism isn't something that just goes away. It's not a disease, it's not something that can be cured. And yet, Chester no longer showed any signs of his previous behavior whatsoever. His personality seemed intact. The sort of things he now spoke aloud seemed relatively in keeping with the sentences he would have previously written on the whiteboard. He still had the same love of reading, the same interest in ghost stories, 
he still played with the same toys. In all respects, he was the exact same boy as before, simply now he was neurotypical. He didn't have to wear earplugs out in public anymore, and true to his word, he never ran off when under stress. He didn't even flap his hands, he just kept them calmly at his sides. It was totally surreal. One day I was teaching him his lessons out in the woods, and he told me, Mom. I think I want to go to regular school. I want to be with the other kids. I was completely taken aback. Chester had never shown even the slightest interest in going to a public school before this, and on the few occasions he'd had to interact with other children, he'd been far too shy to play with them. Of course, I told him I'd be happy to send him to school, what else was I supposed to say? That night I sent emails to the nearest schools in the area, asking about late enrollment. It was the second week after Chester's sudden and unprecedented transformation that I began to notice something else that was strange. Despite the fact that we were spending a decent amount of time outside in the woods, Chester never left any dirty footprints in the house anymore. It wasn't that he had suddenly become more careful about taking his shoes off, he was still running inside with his sneakers on the same as he always had, but there was never any dirt or mud. I just assumed at the time he must have been wiping his shoes off while I wasn't looking, and in all honesty, I didn't pay it much mind. It's only in retrospect, knowing what I do now, that this sticks out in my mind. He also didn't eat very much anymore. He didn't snack at all, and whenever I prepared him his meals, he only ate very small portions. He never showed any signs of weakness or that he was losing weight, so I didn't bother him about it, there would be no point in forcing him to eat more than he wanted to, but it did strike me as very odd. It wasn't until the incident with the mirror that I realized that it wasn't my son. I was looking for some books I'd packed away in cardboard boxes in the spare room. There wasn't a lot of space on the bookshelf in the living room, so I tended to switch out the books on a semi-regular basis for ones kept in the spare room, aside from a handful of mainstays. It was while I was doing so that Chester walked over to the doorway and asked me where I had put his toy robot. I looked up from what I was doing to answer him when I caught something out of the corner of my eye, something deeply wrong. It was an old silver mirror, pointed towards the doorway. It wasn't reflecting my son, I turned to look closer, my words dying on my lips as I gazed at the figure in the mirror, the old terror I'd always felt looking into such things resurfacing suddenly and violently. The thing was dressed in Chester's clothes, but that was about the only real resemblance the thing bore to him. It was a crude marionette, carved from untreated and unpainted wood, clumps of bark still clinging to it in places. The mouth had a jaw like that of a ventriloquist dummy, albeit with crooked teeth made from sharp flints jammed into the wood. I saw bits of old food stuck to the teeth and mouth, remnants of meals I had cooked earlier in the day. The eyes were simple holes with bits of colored glass, like marbles, held within. It was suspended above the ground by an inch or two by thick brown twine, like the sort one would use to close a package in days before packing tape. I stared in stunned silence at the mirror before turning around, only to find Chester standing there, head cocked slightly in confusion. Are you okay, mom? He asked, with concern in his voice. I turned once again to the mirror, seeing the horrible puppet thing once again. I wanted to vomit as I watched its jaw work up and down mockingly. I'm sorry, I'll find it myself, I didn't mean to bother you, it said, before jerkily walking down the hallway to Chester's bedroom. That night I watched Chester carefully in the bathroom mirror when he brushed his teeth, but there didn't seem to be anything strange about him at all. He moved like a person, not a puppet, and when I gently squeezed his shoulder, I felt flesh and bone underneath the fabric of his clothes, not hard wood, and bark. I didn't sleep. Creepy as it may sound, I just sat in Chester's room and watched that thing lay in bed, snoring. It seemed to be asleep. I stayed there all night, just watching, until it woke up the next morning, asking me what I was doing. 
I didn't respond and left without making breakfast. It's not like it would have needed it, I wasn't even sure where I was going at first, I was just driving to clear my head. I eventually realized I was en route to an antique store in the next town over. I'd visited the store a few times before, looking for bits of furniture and the like immediately after moving. I didn't know why I was headed there now, but it felt almost as if I were being drawn there somehow. I pulled into the parking lot and left my car, pushing through the shop's door with the tinkling of a bell. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, I just wandered the store in a daze, looking around at all the various bits of junk and knickknacks with disinterest. The whole store reeked of musty books and wood polish, the smell lulling me into a sort of trance as I meandered among the shelves stacked with discarded history. Eventually, though, I found something that struck my eye. It was a small old hand mirror with the telltale tarnishing of real silver. It seemed to call to me somehow, and in my numbed state, I didn't even fear the blank-eyed reflection that looked back at me. I picked it up and looked at the price tag. Fifty dollars. More than it was worth, but not too unreasonable. I picked it up and brought it to the counter, paying in cash. The store's proprietor, a thin old woman with graying hair and enormous spectacles, chuckled at me as she rang me up. Planning on making a vampire hunting kit, ma'am, she asked. What? I replied, the completely bizarre question startling me out of my stupor. Just a little joke. Halloween's coming up, and once a few years back I had a gentleman come in here and buy up all sorts of strange stuff. I asked him what he needed it for, and he told me he was going to dress up as Abraham Van Helsing for the occasion. He said he was making a vampire hunting kit. One of the items he bought was an old hand mirror, rather like this one. He asked me if it was really silver, and I told him yes, but asked why that mattered, I figured silver was always the sort of thing one would use for werewolves, not vampires. He told me that the reason why vampires didn't show their reflections in mirrors was that in the old days, they were made of silver, and that silver was a symbol of purity. He said that if vampires were real and walking about nowadays, they'd be reflected back just fine since nearly all modern mirrors are made with aluminum. Doesn't tarnish, I suppose. My mind flashed to Chester brushing his teeth in the bathroom mirror, face as normal as could be reflecting back at me, before recalling the terrifying thing I'd seen in the old silver mirror. The old woman must have noticed me go pale, she asked me if I was alright. I nodded and left with the mirror, driving back home. I got back around lunchtime, and the thing that pretended to be my son asked me if I was okay and if we would be having lunch soon. I angled the mirror so I could see its face and saw that crude puppet mouth wagging in vague time with its speech. I told it to wait at the dinner table and that I would be with it in a few minutes. It did as I said, sitting down and pretending to read a book with its glass eyes. I reached into the kitchen drawer and pulled out a large, heavy meat cleaver. The thing was still sitting at the table, head bobbing slightly to the rhythm of its non-existent breathing as it read the non-existent book. I hesitated, trembling, unable to bring the cleaver down on it. My son had been taken, replaced by this awful marionette, but I couldn't bear to destroy the puppet. It was the only piece of him that I had left. I dropped the cleaver, tears streaming down my face, and ran out the front door, leaving the puppet behind. I don't know what happened to it after I left, and I honestly don't care. I got into my car and drove away from that house, away from those woods, away from the thing that stole my son. I never went back. I'm sorry if this story sounds strange or unbelievable, but it's all true. I've never told anyone about this before, but I needed to get it off my chest. I miss Chester every day, and I wish I could have saved him from whatever that thing was. I don't know where he is now, but I hope he's at peace, wherever that may be. Story 3 Two years have passed since my friend, Liz, went missing from that ominous hotel. 
I've been on a relentless quest to find her ever since. It's a search that has consumed me, and I'm sharing this story now because I fear I may not return, and the more people who know what happened, the better. Maybe, just maybe, someone will believe us. Liz and I had a tradition. Every year after college graduation, we'd embark on a vacation to a new city, creating cherished memories together. In late summer 2021, Liz received an email offering her a free week-long stay at a hotel. While not unusual for her due to frequent business travel, the prospect of a ritzy, unfamiliar location enticed us. Yet, the moment we stepped into the hotel's lobby, an unsettling feeling overcame me. It was difficult to put into words, but something about the place didn't sit right. The hotel appeared to be an old building that had undergone recent renovations, attempting to mask decades of despair with a veneer of cheerfulness. The air was oppressively heavy with a sense of foreboding. Liz, oblivious to the strange vibes, didn't seem bothered at first. The hotel's check-in clerk gave us an odd, lingering look before muttering that he needed to consult his manager. Anxious thoughts of a scam crossed our minds, but to our relief, the clerk returned with a grin, offering us an upgraded room with a stunning view of the city skyline and distant mountains. The first day passed without incident, but the following morning, I awoke to find Liz sitting motionless on her bed, her back to me. Her silence concerned me, and when I attempted to rouse her, she spoke in hushed tones as if afraid of being overheard. Did you hear it last night? She asked, her voice trembling. I shook my head, prompting her to reveal her unease. She explained that she couldn't sleep due to a persistent scratching sound emanating from behind the wall. As a heavy sleeper, I wasn't bothered by noises, but Liz's sensitivity often made her anxious during our travels. I hoped she would grow accustomed to the sounds or dismiss them as the building settling. However, the day before we were set to check out, Liz awoke me in a state of panic. She had moved her nightstand, revealing a small, ancient door about three feet tall that had been hidden behind it. The door, made of dark wood with an antique knob, stood in stark contrast to the room's modern decor. Did you open it? I inquired. Liz recoiled, her expression revealing her terror. I cautiously opened the door, revealing a corridor filled with pungent odors of rust and bleach. It was narrow, extending farther than my phone's light could reach. I had to crawl inside, despite my aversion to confined spaces in darkness, as Liz's weary eyes implored me. The passage felt oppressive, and my mind fixated on the whispering sounds coming from behind the old wallpaper. I exited the space, feeling a sense of dread that lingered long after. It was a place that exuded malevolence, and I couldn't fathom its purpose. Attempting to reassure Liz, I suggested packing up and finding a different hotel for our final night. She hesitated but ultimately agreed to stay, reasoning that a room change might incur extra charges. Reluctantly, we resolved to endure another night. That night, after turning out the lights, I noticed Liz's silhouette sitting motionless on her bed until I drifted off to sleep. That was the last time I saw her. When I awoke, it was nearly noon, and both our alarms blared. Liz was missing, leaving her belongings behind. Panic washed over me as I realized she hadn't taken her purse, phone, or even her shoes. The locked and chained main door provided no escape route, and I had no choice but to investigate the door concealed behind the nightstand. Liz wasn't there, but the door led to a tunnel, stretching beyond my phone's light. With trepidation, I entered, crawling through the narrow, endless darkness. The walls felt like they were closing in on me, and despair filled the void. After an eternity, I reached an expansive room, devoid of light and windows, featuring a set of stairs that led above and below. The place exuded a sense of wrongness, and I wondered about its sinister history. The stairs hinted at similar tunnels above and below, connecting the rooms. Descending, I encountered a heavy door, and the brilliant sunlight outside stung my eyes as I emerged into a back alley. 
The door blended seamlessly into the wall, inconspicuous and discreet. I reported Liz's disappearance to the police, but their response was dismissive. They believed she had chosen to vanish, and their indifference left me feeling helpless. I scoured the city for any sign of her, but all efforts proved futile. Two years later, an unexpected email